Hello everybody, welcome to Blue Marble Science. I want to take us through the process of calculating the universal gravitational constant. You know, that thing we call Big G. And we're going to do that for measurements we obtained by running the Cavendish experiment. But before we do that, I think it would be useful to go back and remind ourselves how the Cavendish experiment actually works. The enclosure you see there in the center of the frame houses a thing called a torsion balance. That's actually just a horizontal pendulum. It's inside that enclosure because the forces we're trying to measure are very minute, on the order of maybe 50 nano newtons. That's such a tiny force that any kind of movement of air currents would affect the accuracy of the measurements. So we put it in an airtight enclosure. And that's what you see here. But let's take a look inside and see what this thing consists of. With the covers removed, we can see the torsion balance. And it consists of this beam that has two small lead balls suspended from each end. Those balls weigh about 780 grams apiece. And the entire assembly is hanging from a torsion wire. Now that wire is almost impossible to see in this photograph, but here's a close-up of the top. And there you can see that very small diameter wire and its attachment to the centering device that's uh, mounted at the top of the enclosure. The purpose of that is to be able to center the beam in the enclosure when the large weights are in a neutral position. Now, of course, we need two large weights on the outside of the enclosure. You can't see the one on the other side that's being obscured by the enclosure, but you can plainly see the one on this side. That's a 22 kilogram lead sphere. And we can put it in one of three positions. It could either be close to the enclosure on the left side, or it can be rotated into a position where it's close to the enclosure on the right side, or it could be virtually lined up with the center of the box, in which case it would be equidistant from both of the small balls. So that's how the experiment works. We move those large lead weights from one side to the other and measure how much rotation we get in the balance beam. Now the measurement is made by reflecting a laser off a mirror that is mounted at the center of the beam. That is being projected on a scale that's about 10 feet away. The advantage of doing it this way is that we multiply the movement of the beam by a factor of a little bit over 10. So if the end of the torsion balance moves 4 millimeters, the laser spot moves 40 millimeters. Here's another picture of the enclosure all sealed up with the balls in a position that I call west. We're basically facing north in this picture. So I'm using the position of the ball on the far side to specify what condition the experiment is in. And that'll be consistent throughout all the testing. We only need to know a few things to be able to calculate the value of big G. One thing we need to know is the distance of the small balls from the center of rotation on the beam. That happens to be 24 inches. We also need to know what the distance is between the center of the masses when the balls are in their resting positions, either one end or the other. We need to measure the rotation angle, and that's actually going to be measured as a distance, a distance that the end of that arm moves. We'll also need to know the magnitude of the large masses, and that happens to be 22.03 kilograms each. So now we have everything we need to know. Let's work on the calculations. First of all, let's define what torque is. And torque is simply a force acting at a distance from a point of rotation. We normally use the small letter tau to symbolize torque. And the formula is tau is equal to F times D. But in the case of Cavendish, we have a second force acting on the other end of the beam both trying to rotate or torque the wire in the same direction. So the formula we really want is tau is equal to 2 times F times D. 
But remember, this force is the force of gravitational attraction. And we know from Newtonian physics that that force is equal to g times the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance between their centers. So if we substitute that in our first expression, we end up with torque is equal to 2 times g times the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance between their centers times d, that expression right there. Now that gives us the torque that we need to move the balance from the equilibrium point to one side, but remember we're going to swap positions with those large masses and that will double the angle theta and that will also double the amount of torque required. So what we need is 2 times the torque, and that is equal to 4g times the product of the masses divided by the square of the distance between their centers times d, and we'll call that the change in torque, or delta t, and that's expression number 1. Now in linear motion for a spring, we have a formula that says f is equal to minus k times x, where k is the spring constant and x is the amount of extension or compression of the spring. In torsional motion, we've got a similar expression that says tau is equal to minus kappa times theta. And kappa is the torsion constant for the torsion element, and theta is the angle of displacement. That gives us equation number two. The change in torque is equal to minus kappa times the change in theta. Perfect. Now we have two expressions that tell us how torque changes in this system. And in a few minutes we're going to combine these two things. But first let's talk about something else. Remember that a torsion balance is simply a horizontal pendulum. And like any pendulum we can define the period of oscillation of the pendulum. That's equation number three. The period of oscillation is 2 pi times the square root of the moment of inertia divided by kappa, which is the torsion constant. Now in physics and engineering, the moment of inertia is mass multiplied by the square of the distance to the neutral axis, or in this case, the point of rotation. But remember that we have two small masses on this pendulum. So the equation we're looking for, for the moment of inertia, is I is equal to 2 times little m times d squared. That's equation number 4. Now this is a little bit inaccurate because it doesn't consider the mass of the actual wooden beam itself. And that needs to be included, but we don't have to do that for these calculations today. So now we have a way of defining the period of oscillation, and we know how to define the moment of inertia. Let's go back and revisit equation 1 and equation 2 from the previous slide. And you'll recall that both of those describe how torque changes. So let's set them equal to each other and we end up with this expression. And obviously we can solve that for kappa or the torsion constant. And when we do we find out that kappa is equal to 4g times the product of the masses times the distance from one of the small masses to the center of rotation divided by r squared which is the distance between the large and small masses times the change in theta. That's equation number five, so now let's put all of this together. Equation three gave us the period of oscillation if we knew the moment of inertia and the torsion constant. Equation four tells us how to calculate the moment of inertia, and equation five tells us how to figure out the torsion constant. So really all we have to do now is plug equations 4 and 5 into equation 3. And when we do that, we end up with this mess. The period of oscillation is 2 pi times the square root of i is the 2md squared you see on top, divided by kappa, the torsion constant. So since we're dividing, we just flip that thing upside down. The r squared delta theta goes up on top, and the 4g big M little m d goes on the bottom. Whoa, what a mess. So let's see if we can simplify that a little bit. The 2 on the top goes away, the 4 on the bottom becomes a 2. The little m's will cancel, and the d on the bottom will cancel one of the d's on the top. 
So now we end up with this expression. We can get rid of that square root if we square both sides of the equation. So when we do that, we end up with t squared is equal to 4 pi squared r squared d delta theta over 2 gm. And we can even simplify that a little bit. The 4 becomes a 2 and the 2 on the bottom goes away. And now all we need to do is swap places with t squared and g and we end up with our final expression. g is equal to 2 pi squared r squared d delta theta divided by big M t squared. And we're done. So now we know how to calculate the universal gravitational constant simply by measuring the displacement of the torsion balance when we move the masses from one position to the other position and by measuring the period of oscillation of the torsion balance. So let's see what happens when we actually try this. Here's a preliminary test I ran a couple of days ago. The torsion balance was allowed to sit overnight and stabilize, and it was showing a steady reading of about 242 millimeters. Now you'll see it move a little bit right at first because just my presence out there setting up the time lapse is enough to disturb it. But about 45 minutes into this, I actually moved the weights from the west position to the east position and when I do that you'll see a very dramatic change in the behavior of this thing. So those radical oscillations are what happens when we move the weights from one side to the other side and you'll see over a period of time the oscillations slowly subside and eventually it's going to come to a point of rest at about 201 or 201.5 millimeters. So what does that mean in terms of our calculations? This is a spreadsheet that incorporates the formula we just derived for calculating the gravitational constant. Previously I had measured the oscillation period of that balance to be 1079.9 seconds. Now using the two resting points from that test a couple of days ago I calculate the gravitational constant to be 6.629 times 10 to the minus 11th. That's within about a half percent of the accepted value. Bear in mind these are preliminary tests and there's a lot more testing to come, but I would say at this point the results are very encouraging. So that's where we're at at the moment. Hey, thanks for watching. You guys stay tuned, there's a lot more testing to come. Don't forget to hit those little buttons down there. Press the little bell if you want notifications. There's a link to the Patreon and the PayPal if you want to contribute to the project. Please feel free. Link's up in the description. But a special shout out, of course, to the patrons and the, and the folks that have supported the project. And with that, I guess I'll catch you guys on the next one.